Shalom. My name is Adam, and I welcome you to the parable of the vineyard. Every day, Yahuwah is waking up a remnant, a group of people who are coming out of deceptions, realizing our walk is to consist of faith and obedience to His righteous commands. Each week, we read through and examine a portion of the Torah, allowing the Spirit of the Most High to guide, teach, and open our eyes and ears to the wondrous matters out of His law. Join us as we seek to be refined by His Word, preparing ourselves for the return of our King of Kings, being faithful and obedient, walking in His way, truth, and life. Shabbat Shalom and welcome back brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube live stream of our Torah portion reading. My name is Adam, your host, and I welcome you. This is week 40, Balak, which covers numbers 22 through 25, 9. Uh, it's the story of Balak, the king of Moab, who hires Balaam, the magician, enchanter, the diviner, to curse Israel. But there's lots of plot twists and even a talking donkey. Very interesting Torah portion, lots to cover. Let's pray. Father, Yahuwah Most High, Yahuwah Sebaot, we come before you in your son, Yahusha's glorious name. And Father, we thank you for showing us your son and showing us his sacrifice that he made for us and acknowledging that he is king and high priest over us and that he purchased us with his blood. Father, we just ask that eyes and ears will be opened as we read through your Torah that we may be faithful hearers and doers of your word. And Father, we are excited for the return of Yahusha. May he come soon. In his name we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. And Shabbat Shalom. Don't let anyone tell you that Shabbat's not important. He says that it's a sign between him and his people. He like marks them like, ah, you reverence my Shabbat. You acknowledge that I made the heavens and the earth in six days. On the seventh, I rested, and I gave you this pattern forever. And you're walking in that. In a good way. It's not like a, it's a, like a stamp on your head. Seal in the forehead. Any case. Um, so, yeah, interesting Torah portion. But before we go anywhere, let's uh, let's blow the old shofar. I, this is an old one. I, I got to really do a new one here. But here, anyways. That's right. Praise him with the shofar. All right, here we go. We're going to be reading Numbers 22. And uh, here we are. And we're going to cross-reference with uh, many of the things. We're going to dive into this interesting topic of Balaam. Um, and I think there's a interesting storyline here that we don't really get unless we look into some of the other books of Scripture that were the Most High decided would not be in the canon. But he left little breadcrumbs for those who want to search the matter out. It's the glory of Elohim to conceal a matter, and it's the honor of kings to search them out. And that's what we're going to do today as we go through this Torah portion. Just in case you're new, well, all, from a bird's eye view, what we like to do is go through the Torah portion and glean what we can, how we can keep his Torah either literally or, or spiritually um, and any lessons that it can we can glean from it and apply to our walks to strengthen our faith, and um, you know this is a relationship with him to strengthen that relationship. I do my best to share with you the understanding that I have at this time. This is conducted more like a study uh, rather than like I'm teaching you. This is more like a study. Like hey, if we're hanging out in my living room, I would share with you how I understand it. Doesn't mean I'm right on everything. I want to be. That's, I'm striving for that, but just like you, right? We're just a guy, just a man doing my best. So with that understanding, let's go. All right, Numbers 22. And the children of Yashrael set forward and pitched in the plains of Moab on this side of the Yardan by Jericho. Well, that was actually last week's Torah portion, but it makes more sense to go ahead and read it here anyways. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Yashrael had done to the Amorim. 
And Moab was sore afraid of the people because there were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licks up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabim at that time. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beor to Pithor, which is by the river of the land by the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Mitzrayim. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray you, curse me, this people, for they are too mighty for me. Perchance I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom, he whom you curse is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spoke unto him the words of Balak. Now, it's very interesting that they obviously, he, Balaam had a reputation. He was famous. But, you know, we don't get any of that here. The Most High didn't have that revealed here in the Torah. But it's all throughout the, the book of Yashar. The book of Yashar details the life of Balaam. Uh, it was, I think it was in the war with Chittim. Either he was with Chittim or against Chittim. Um, in any case, he used uh, divination to uh, find out that, hey, you're going to lose. You better back off, you know. Um, so we're not going to cover that today. Just anyways, but uh, or it may be in my notes. I can't remember, but uh, we're going to take a look at that. But let's, uh, let's keep reading, and we're going to kind of go back and just dive into this. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with... Oh, yeah, depart with the rewards of divination in their hand, and they came unto Balaam and spoke unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as Yahweh shall speak unto me. And the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And Elohim came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with you? So this is interesting. Elohim, right? Elohim came to him and said, Whoa. Now, um, we've been studying, I've been sharing with you for a couple of years how I do believe that Messiah did interact uh, quite a bit with the patriarchs, with the prophets. Um, his title being, you know, Messiah being Elohim, also being the angel of Yahuwah, not just like some angel, like, but like the angel, the angel of the presence. Um, as we see in Isaiah 63, that the, the angel of the presence saves the people. Um, uh, was it Psalm, is it Psalm 36? The angel of Yahuwah defends those that fear him. So anyways, interesting. And Balaam said unto Elohim, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Mitzrayim, which covers the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them, perchance I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. And Elohim said unto Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So who is this Balaam that Elohim would even speak to them? I haven't had him speak to me like that. Has he spoken to you like that? How does Balaam get this honor? And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into the land, for Yahuwah refuses to give me leave to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. And Balak sent yet again princes, more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray you, hinder you from coming unto me. For I will promote you unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever you say unto me. Come therefore, I pray you, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of Yahuwah Elohai, who is our Messiah, and the Sefer rightly, um, capital W there, word of El Yahuwah Elohai, to do less or more. So, you know, there's so much scripture, especially in the, in the book of Revelation, that's just like, uh, was it Peter and Revelation, just like, you know, don't go uh, after the way of Balaam, you know, that wicked man. And you're, and you're reading this, you're like, well, hold on. He's kind of saying the right things right here, right? Like, uh, what do you want me to do? Like, I, I can't do anything more than he tells me. He says I can't go. So you can give me all the money you want, but I can't go. Like, those are the right words. So, like, what happened here? We're going to go through the history, and, and I have, well, I have a theory. And we'll be contest that, of course. So now, therefore, I pray you, tear you also here this night, that I may know what Yahuwah will say unto me. And Elohim came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men call, come to call you, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto you, that shall you do. So now he's giving them, like, now the, uh, the Messiah, or, or 
Elohim is like, hey, if they do this and this, then you go with him. But if you go with him, I'll do only the word that I say unto you. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And Elohim's anger was kindled because he went. So you're like, wait a minute. You just told him he can go, and now you're mad that he went. So there, it's it's not said, but there's this requirement here. If the men come to call you, rise up and go with them. So it's not really spoken that they didn't do that, but it's kind of assumed they didn't do that because he did give him permission to go only on certain uh, if certain things were fulfilled. So that must not have been fulfilled, and he went anyways. In the uh, Targums, I think it says, uh, what does it say? Um, but the anger of Yahweh was provoked because he would go that he might curse them. So there's also the thought that maybe uh, he just had, you know, wickedness in his heart. He's like, oh, oh. he gave, uh, Elohim gave me an opportunity. He said, if, if, if I can go, well, I'm just going to go. And so I can get these rewards. Possibly. Speculation, though. And Elohim's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of Yahuwah stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of Yahuwah standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way, and went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her out into the way. But the angel of Yahuwah stood in a path in the vineyards, a wall being on this side, and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of Yahuwah, she thrust herself into the wall, and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of Yahweh went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of Yahweh, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And Yahweh opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto you that you have smitten me these three times? I don't know what the donkey would sound like. but And Balaam said unto the ass, Because you have mocked me. I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. And the ass said unto Blom, And that I your ass, upon which you have ridden ever since I was yours unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto you? And he said, Nay. Then Yahuwah opened the eyes of Balaam, and saw the angel of Yahuwah standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. Man, he, Elohim is doing some interesting things with Balaam, like opening his eyes so he can see the angelic. Like, has that happened to me or you or any of us? Man. Why is he get at this treatment? And the angel of Yahweh said unto him, Wherefore have you smitten him, your ass, these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand you, because your way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned from me, surely now also I had slain you and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of Yahweh, I have sinned. So we've seen some interesting things from Balaam. He's like, I can't, I can only do what Yahweh says. You can give me all the money in the world, but I can't do it unless what he says. And here... There's repentance. I have sinned. He's like, I for forgive me. I've sinned. Now, repentance is a lot easier for someone who's seen an angel or the angel of Yahweh or Messiah, right? That would, you know, probably provoke a lot of people to repentance. I'm, uh, anyways, nevertheless, he still repented, right? So there's some merit there. For I knew not that you stood in the way against me. Now, there, therefore, if it displeases you, I will get me back again. He's like, I'll just go home. And the angel of Yahweh said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto you, that shall you speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him to the city of Moab, which is in the border of Arnon, which is the outmost coast, which is in the out utmost coast. Sorry. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto you to call you? Wherefore came you not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote you to honor? And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am coming to you. He's like, <laughs> I can just see this conversation. Block's like, why didn't you come? I was trying to get all this money. And Block's like, or Balaam's like, I'm here. <laughs> Have I and now any power at all to say anything? The word that Elohim puts in my mouth, that shall I speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kiryat Chutzot. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him into a high place, into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. I think in the last portion we said that they covered like the camps of Israel covered like six miles. All right. So now, as before we go, so we finished chapter twenty-two, but now we're going to kind of go back and, and and go through it. So, um, so 
you know, why would Elohim speak with Balaam? Especially because there's all this writing against him in the New Testament to like, don't go his way. Uh, don't go his way. Oops. Um, so let's take a look at this. So would Elohim speak with anyone who is not perfect in their heart? Let's take a look at Isaiah. I'm going to turn my ringer off so this doesn't happen again. I usually do a good job of that. Isaiah 36, 1 through 10. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto King Hezekiah with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. Then came forth unto him Eliakim, son of Hilkiah's son, which was over the house, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, Asaph's son, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein you trustest? I say, Say you, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Lo, you trust in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, wherein if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is the king of Pharaoh of Egypt to all that trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in Yahweh Elohim, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said unto Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now, therefore, give pledges, I pray you, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you be able to, on your part to set riders upon them. How, then, will you turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Am I now come up without Yahuwah against this land to destroy it? Yahuwah said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now, there's two options here. Either he's lying or... Yahuwah sent a messenger or, or uh, even Elohim himself, you know, went to them and said, go, go up and, you know, go up and, you know, destroy this land. Obviously to test. And we know how that worked out uh, for Hezekiah. Obviously he trusted in Yah and Assyria was defeated. You know, so either he lied or Elohim told him to go do it. It's only two options. Isaiah 10, 5 through 6. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff of their hand is in my indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath while I give him a charge to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. And we know that that absolutely happened with the northern kingdom, right? Um, so kind of very interesting. In Revelation 17, 17, For Elohim has put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of Elohim shall be fulfilled. So it's like, you know, the Most High is directing all this. So is it possible he can speak to evil people? And use them for his purposes. I, th I think we have, you know, a couple, you know, a couple resources to 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 say that. Uh, and it said, I'm sorry, it's also in here. Um, I meant to look this up for you earlier when we were reading it. Isaiah 10:6. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and send the people, and against the people of my wrath, I will give him a charge. Which we look at this Hebrew root here, Sava. It's a command, right? To command, to give orders, lay charge, give it. So he commanded Assyria to go up there. So something interesting. But let's take a look at uh, Balaam's history because I, I think there's something really to uh, that's interesting to learn about him, him. And it relates to people today. Uh, Yashar chapter 67, verse 8. And it was after the death of the king of Shittim that Balaam, the son of Beor, fled from the land of Shittim. And he went and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Pharaoh received him with great honor, for he had heard of his wisdom and gave him presents and made for him a counselor and aggrandized him, right? right? Made him big and, you know, exalted. And Balaam dwelt in Egypt in honor with all the nobles of the king, and the nobles exalted him because they coveted to learn his wisdom. And in the 130th year of Israel's going down to Egypt, Pharaoh dreamed that he was sitting upon his kingly throne and lifted up his eyes and saw an old man standing before him. And there were scales in the hand of the old man, such scales as are used by merchants. And the old man took the scales and hung them before Pharaoh. And the old man took all the elders of Egypt and all its nobles and a great men, and he tied them together and put them in one scale. And he took a milk kid and put it into another scale, and the kid preponderated over all, so he was... Uh, more worthy or um, w uh, he, he outweighed everyone else. 
And Pharaoh was astonished at this dreadful vision, why the kid should preponderate over all. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And Pharaoh rose up early in the morning and called all his servants and related to them the dream, and the men were greatly afraid. And the king said to all his wise men, Interpret, I pray you, the dream which I dreamed, that I may know it. And Balaam, the son of Beor, answered the king and said unto him, This means nothing else but a great evil that will spring up against Egypt in latter days. For a son will be born to Israel who will destroy all of Egypt and its inhabitants and bring forth the Israelites from Egypt with a mighty hand. Now therefore, O king, take counsel upon this matter that you may destroy the hope of the children of Israel and their expectation before this evil arises against Egypt. And the king said unto Balaam, And what shall we do against Israel? Surely after a certain manner did we at first counsel against them and could not prevail over them. This is one um, to, to kind of go back. This uh, first counsel was that t to work them hard. Uh, and, you know, that they would diminish. Well, obviously, that didn't work. They, they kept multiplying. Now, therefore, give you also advice against them by which we may prevail over them. And Balaam answered the king, saying, Send now and call your two counselors, and we will see what their advice is upon this matter, and afterward your servant will speak. So Balaam was kind of like the chief counselor, and there's other counselors. Uh, the other two was um, Jethro, Reuel, um, Moses' eventual father-in-law, and Job who we know from the book of Job. So when the king sent and called the two counselors, Reuel the Midianite and Job the Uzite, and they came and sat before the king. In uh, any case, and so we're going to kind of skip through this. Um, first, Reuel speaks, and he kind of recounts all the great things that happened, like Abraham going down into Egypt and with Sarah um, and Abimelech and uh, all these different things. And he's reminding uh, Pharaoh uh, of all the things he did, told him about Jacob and his his prevailing over all that uh, all the adversity against him. Um, so then he kind of culminates and says, "Now therefore, if it seem good to you in your eyes, cease from destroying the children of Israel. But if it be not your will that they shall dwell in Egypt, send them forth from here, that they may go to the land of Canaan, the land where their ancestors ancestors sojourned." And Pharaoh heard the words of Jethro, and he was angry at him, so that he rose with shame from the king's presence and went to Midian, his land, and took Joseph's stick with him. That comes really interesting later on. But And the king said to Job the Uzite, What do you say, Job? And the king said to Job the Uzite, What do you say, Job? And what is your advice respecting the Hebrews? So Job said to the king, Behold, all the inhabitants of the land are in your power. Let the king do as it seems good in his eyes. So Job, you know, had an opportunity, to be, you know, to to stand up and for what was right, just like, you know, uh, Raul did. He was just like, whatever you want. And the king said unto Balaam, what do you say, Balaam? Speak your word that we may hear it. And Balaam said to the king, of all that the king has counseled against the Hebrews, they will be delivered. And the king will not be able to prevail over them with any counsel. For if you think to lessen them by flaming by the flaming fire, you cannot prevail over them. For surely their Elohim delivered Abraham, their father from the Ur of the Chaldeans. And if you think to destroy them with a sword, surely Isaac, their father, was delivered from it. And a ram was placed in his stead. And if with hard and rigorous labor you think to lessen them, you will not prevail even in this. For their father, Jacob, served Laban in all manner of hard work and prospered. Now therefore, O king, hear my words, for this is the counsel which is counsel against them, by which you will prevail over them, and from which you should not depart. If it please the king, let him order all their children which shall be born from this day forward, and be thrown into the water, for by this can you wipe away their name, for none of them nor their fathers were tried in this manner. And the king heard the words of Balaam, and the thing pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Balaam. And the king ordered a proclamation to be issued, and a law to be made throughout the land of Egypt, saying, Every male child born to the Hebrews from this day forward shall be thrown into the water. And Pharaoh called unto all his servants, saying, Go now, and seek throughout the land Goshen, where the children of Israel are, and see that every son born to the Hebrews shall be cast into the river, but every daughter you shall let live. And so uh, this wicked counsel came from Balaam. And so we're getting a little bit of history um, about him. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Um, so it's very clear that he was in Egypt. And I believe he was in Egypt all the way through um, the plagues. And I'm going to kind of uh, share with you what I what I believe. Um, actually, I'll share that with you after this. So uh, this is another interesting story. This is probably one of the most interesting stories uh, in the book of uh, Yashar. Very peculiar. And uh, it answers the question, you know, why Moses stuttered. I mean, some people just are, you know, born stuttering. Um but I think Moses, something actually physically happened to him, and we'll see that here in this chapter.
We're going to read Jasher 70. And in the third year from the birth of Moshe, Pharaoh was sitting at a banquet when Alparanith, the queen, was sitting at his right and Bathia on his left. Bathia is the, was the mother, um, the daughter of Pharaoh that um, adopted Moshe. Bathia had his left and the lad Moshe was lying upon her bosom. And Balaam, the son of Beor, with his two sons, which is Jonas and Jamres, um, and all the princes of the kingdom were sitting at the table in the king's presence. And the lad stretched forth his hand, Moses, upon the king's head and took the crown from the king's head and placed it on his own head. Ooh. And when the king and the princes saw the work by which the boy had done, the king and the princes were terrified. And one man to his neighbor expressed astonishment. They were like, ooh, did you see that? And the king said unto the princes who were before him at the table, What speak you and what say you, O ye princes, in this matter? And what is to be the judgment against the boy on account of this act? And Balaam, the son of Beor, the magician, answered before the king and the princes, and he says, Remember now, O my master and king, the dream which you did dream many days since, and that which your servant interpreted unto you? Now, therefore, this is a child from the Hebrew children, in whom is the spirit of Elohim. And let not my master the king imagine that this youngster did this thing without knowledge. For he is a Hebrew boy, and wisdom and understanding are with him, although he is yet a child. And with wisdom he has done and done this and chosen unto himself the kingdom of Egypt. For this is the manner of all the Hebrews to deceive kings and their nobles, to do all these things cunningly in order to make the kings of the earth and their men tremble. Surely you know that Abraham their father acted this way, who deceived the army of Nimrod king of Babel and Abimelech king of Gerar, and that he possessed himself of the land of the children of Heth and all the kingdoms of Canaan. And that he descended into Egypt and said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister, in order to mislead Egypt and her king. So you can see he's kind of just twisting the truth. And that's what people still do today. They'll take something uh, and they'll twist it, right, to be false. His son Isaac also did so when he went to Gerar and dwelt there and is strengthened and prevailed over the army of Abimelech, king of the Philistines. He also thought of making the kingdom of the Philistines stumble and saying that Rebekah, his wife, was his sister. Jacob also dealt treacherously with his brother and took from his hand his birthright and his blessing. He went then to Badan Aram, the house of Laban, his mother's brother, and cunningly obtained from him his daughter, his cattle, and all belonging to him, and fled away and returned to the land of Canaan to his father. His sons sold their brother Yosef, who went down into Egypt and became a slave and was placed in the prison house for twelve years, until the former Pharaoh dreamed dreams and withdrew him from the prison house and magnified him above all the princes in Egypt on account of his interpreting his dreams to him. And when Elohim caused a famine throughout the land, he sent for it and brought his father and all his brothers and the whole of his father's household and supported them without price or reward and brought and bought the Egyptians for slaves. Now, therefore, my master and king, behold, this child has risen up in their stead in Egypt to do according to their deeds and to trifle with every king and prince and judge. If it please the king, let us now spill his blood upon the ground, lest he grow up and take away the government from your hand and the hope of Egypt perish after he shall have reigned. And Balaam said to the king, Let us moreover call for all the judges of Egypt and the wise men thereof, and let us know if the judgment of death is due to this boy, as you did say, and then we will slay him. And Pharaoh sent and called for all the wise men of Egypt, and they came before the king. And an angel of Yahuwah came amongst them, and he was like one of those wise men of Egypt. And the king said to the wise men, Surely you have heard what this Hebrew boy who is in the house has done, and thus has Balaam judged in the matter. Now judge you also and see what is due to the boy for the act he has committed. And the angel, who seemed like one of the wise men of Pharaoh, answered and said as follows, Before all the wise men of Egypt, before the king and the princes, If it please the king, let the king send for the men who shall bring before him an onyx stone and a coal of fire, and place them before the child. And if the child shall stretch forth his hand and take the onyx stone, then shall we know that with wisdom has the youth done all that he has done, and we must slay him. But... If he stretch forth his hand upon the coal, then we shall know that it was not with knowledge that he did this thing, and he shall live. And the thing seemed good in the eyes of the king and the princes, so the king did according to the word of the angel of Yahuwah. And the king ordered the onyx stone and the coal to be brought in place before Moshe. And they placed the boy before them, and the lad endeavored to stretch forth his hand to the onyx stone. <laughs> right, so Moshe's like, oh yeah, onyx stone. But the angel of Yahuwah took his hand and placed it upon the coal, and the coal became, became extinguished in his hand, and he lifted it up and put it into his mouth, and burned part of his lips and part of his tongue, and he became heavy in mouth and tongue. And I believe this is why he uh, had a speech impediment. 
And when the king and the princess saw this, they knew that Moshe had not acted with wisdom in taking off the crown from the king's head. So the king and the princess refrained from slaying the child. So Moshe remained in Pharaoh's house growing up, and Yahweh was with him. Uh, somewhere in here, I think it shows as he grew up. Yeah. And so when Moshe asked uh, about the labor upon his people day by day, and they told him all that had befallen him and all the injunctions which Pharaoh had put upon them before his birth. And they told him all the counsels which Balaam, the son of Beor, had counseled against them and what he had counseled against them, right? Anyways, I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, so, oh, and, and you know, it does say here, it says... And when Moshe heard these things, his anger was kindled against Balaam, and he sought to kill him, and he was an ambush for him for day by day. And Balaam was afraid of Moshe, and he and his two sons rose up and went forth from Egypt, and they fled and delivered their souls, right? So I, I, um, I, I apologize. He, so he was not there during the time of the plagues, but um, I believe he heard about everything. So obviously Balaam knew about Abraham and, and Jacob and heard about all these things. Um, it, I think it's safe to say he heard about uh, what happened to Egypt uh, after he left. Um, and last thing here, just want to read uh, Yashar 79, 20 through 42. Um, so, you know what? So, Balaam is here. So, he must have fled and then came back. Oh, he came. That's right. Balaam did flee. I'm sorry. And then he came back after he heard Moshe was gone. That's right. Okay. So, yeah my initial thought that he was there throughout the, the uh, plagues. I'm sorry for the back and forth. Um, 79, Joshua 79, 20 through 42. And Moshe and Aharon rose up early on the next day, and they went to the house of Pharaoh, and they took in their hands the stick of Elohim. And when they came to the king's gate, two young lions were confined there with iron instruments, and no person went out or in and came in before them, unless those whom the king ordered to come when the conjurers came and withdrew the lions by their incantations. And this brought them to the king. And Moshe hastened and lifted up the stick upon the lions, and he loosed them. And Moshe and Aharon came into the king's house. The lions also came with him in joy, and they followed them, and rejoiced as a dog rejoices over his master when he comes from the, from the field. And when Pharaoh saw this thing, he was astonished at it, and he was greatly terrified at the report, for their appearance was like the appearance of the children of Elohim. And Pharaoh said to Moshe, What do you require? And they answered him, saying, Yahweh Elohim of the Hebrews has sent us to you, to say, Send forth my people that they may serve me. And when Pharaoh heard their words, he was greatly terrified before them. And he said to them, Go today and come back to me tomorrow. And they did according to the word of the king. And when they had gone, Pharaoh sent for Balaam, the magicians, and to Jonas and Jambres, his sons, and to all the magicians and the conjurers and the counselors which belonged to the king. And they all came and sat before the king. And the king told them all the words which Moshe and his brother Aharon had spoken to them. And the magician said to the king, But how came the men to you on account of the lions which were confined at the gate? The king said, Because they lifted up their rod against the lions and loosed them, and came to me. And the lions also rejoiced at them as a dog rejoices to meet the, his master. And Balaam, the son of Beor, the magician, answered to the king, saying, These are none else than the magicians like ourselves. Now, therefore, send for them and let them come, and we will try them. And the king did so. And anyways, it goes on to talk about the, uh, um, the they come back with the rod, and Aaron throws it down. It turns into a serpent, you know, because Balaam was asking for a sign. Um, and then Balaam, the magician, answered and said, This thing has been from the days of old that a serpent should swallow his fellow, and then the living things devour each other. So he keeps dismissing these things as just magic, you know, or just, ah, oh, whatever, this is just normal. And so the king, Pharaoh, who trusted Balaam, is like, Okay, you know, all right, this sounds, this sounds good. So uh, so then, you know, um, I want to read this, but you know what? I think we might read this after next chapter. So I want to put this in check. So later on, we read about, of course, um, holding the teachings of Balaam. You know, I have a few things against you because you have some there to hold the teaching of Balaam, which we know, obviously, we're already seeing here that, like, Balaam is just wicked, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, but there is a, a snag here because we see Balaam saying some of the right things. Like, I, I can only do what, what Yahweh says. I, you know, if you give me all the money in the world, I can only do what he says. Um, you know, he repented before him. So there, there's some... There's something a little different here, and I have a theory about what happened uh, and, you know, what happened at his latter end here, but we'll uh, we'll cover that. I want to read chapter 23, and then I want to share this with you. I, th I think it's kind of interesting that we should take a look at this. Um, and before we get, before we, you know, to finish up with Balaam, I, I want to sp uh, share a couple of things here. Uh, you know, obviously we have a talking donkey, which is like, where did that come from? 
Um, I want to read Jubilees 3. We're going to read Jubilees 3, 18 through the end. And after the completion of seven years, which had completed there seven years exactly in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, the serpent came and approached the woman, and the serpent said to the woman, Has Elohim commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve said, Whoa, a talking serpent, what are you doing? No, she didn't say that. And she just conversed with her, like, Hey. And she said to it, Of all the fruit of the trees of the garden, Elohim has said unto us, Eat. But of the fruit of the tree of the, uh, which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim has said unto us, You shall not eat thereof. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For Elohim knows that on the day ye eat thereof, your eyes will be opened, and ye will be as Elohim, and ye'll know good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was agreeable and pleasant to the eye, and that its fruit was good for food. And she took thereof and ate. And when she had first covered her shame with fig leaves, she gave thereof to Adam, and he ate. And his eyes were opened, and he saw that he was naked. And he took fig leaves and sewed them together and made an apron for himself and covered his shame. And Elohim cursed the serpent and was wroth with it forever. And he was wroth with the woman, because she hearkened to the voice of the serpent, and did eat, and said unto her, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your pains. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your return shall be unto your man, and he will rule over you. And to Adam also he said, Because you have hearkened to the voice of your woman, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded to you, that you should not eat thereof, cursed be the ground for your sake. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat your bread in the sweat of your face, till you return to the earth. From whence you were taken, for earth you are, and unto earth you shall return. Um, here we go. In verse 29. And on that day was closed the mouth of all beasts, and of cattle, and of birds, and of whatsoever walks, and whatsoever moves, so that they could no longer, no longer speak, for they all had spoken with one, spoken one with another, with one lip, and with one tongue. Kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. So, that's why it makes sense when it says... Um, and Yahuwah opened the mouth of the ass because here in Jubilees it said, um, and on that, that day he closed the mouth of all the beasts. So, kind of interesting. And not only that, you know, we see here, he, you know, he's beating the, the donkey. And, he, and the angel of Yahuwah was like, well, why have you smitten your donkey these three times? You know, um, and, and he, you know, it, it's one thing for us to train our animals with like you know a little tap you know like um the correction you know just like our children like you know it says he that spares the rod spares the child but you know i have to say that there's got to be a difference between beating your animal and light correction right just like our children there's got to be a difference between just beating your children senselessly and like you know a little tap on the butt or, or a little correction here or there you know when they get out of line because Proverbs 12.10 says, A righteous man regards the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Right? So Bilam here, it seemed like he was cruel to his beast. Um, he also says, If I had a sword here, I'd kill you. Right? So he was being cruel to his animal. Sure, it was disobeying him, but maybe did he have to, like, did, maybe he struck it so hard. I don't know. Um, but this is just something to think about. You know, obviously, obviously Abba... The Most High loves the animals. He made them, or else he just wouldn't have made them. And we, we just wouldn't have known any better. We would have, there have been no animals. It would just been like trees and forests and it, plants and whatever. And fine, and that would have been great. But there's animals. He loves the animals. I love the animals. Don't you love the animals? Have you ever gone to a zoo? You ever looked at these cute things that he's made? How about that? How about dogs and cats? You know, these domesticated animals. I don't think we should be beating them senselessly. We should regard the life of their beast, of our beasts. So, just something to think about. Okay, so we're going to come back to... I'm going to close this, close this. We're going to come back to this stuff. We're going to go over Revelation 2, 2 Peter 2, Numbers 31, and Matthew 13, 22. I've got a theory with Balaam, so we'll come back to Balaam. All right, so now Numbers 23. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams and Balak did as Balaam had spoken and Balak and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram now what's interesting here is do a just do a word search on offering of a bullock and a ram and you'll have many hits in the book of uh, Leviticus and I think a few in um, Exodus and some in Numbers and you'll find out that this is the command for uh, the peace offering and I believe the whole burnt offering um 
So, Balaam knew what to offer. How did he know that? Numbers 23, 3, And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perchance Yahuwah will come to meet me. And whatsoever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went to a high place. And Elohim met Balaam. And he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. So, you know, Balaam's like, hey, you know, I've, I've done what you've commanded me or shown me before. And Yahweh put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, return unto Balak, and thus shall you speak. And he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up this parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come, defy Yashorel. How shall I curse whom El has not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom Yahweh has not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Yaakov, and number the fourth part of Yashorel? Let me die the death of the Yasharim, the righteous. Which this is the root word of Yashar, the book of Yashar, the righteous, the upright. And let my last end be like his. And Balak said unto Balaam, What have you done unto me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them altogether. And he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which Yahuwah has put into my mouth? And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray you, with me unto another place, from whence you may see them. You shall see but the utmost part of them, and shall not see them all, and curse me them from thence. And he brought him into the field of Sophim, to the top of Pisgah, and built seven altars, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by your burnt offering, while I meet Yahuwah yonder. And Yahuwah met Balaam, and put a word in his mouth, and said, Go again into Balak, and say thus. And we came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What has Yahuwah spoken? And he took up his parable, and said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, you son of Zippor. El is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of Adam that he should repent. He Has he said, and shall he not do it? Or has he spoken, and shall not make it good? Behold, I received commandment to bless, and he has blessed, and cannot reverse it. He has not beheld iniquity in Yaakov, neither has he seen perverseness in Yashrael. Yahweh is with him, and the shadow of a king is among them. And that's kind of interesting, considering everything that we've learned uh, since coming out of Egypt till now, about all the rebellion and... Um, uh, murmuring and complaints and uh, interesting we'll talk about this in a second he brought them out of Mitzrayim he has as it were the strength of a unicorn surely there is no enchantment against Yaakov neither is there any divination against Yashorel according to this time it shall be said of Yaakov and of Yashorel what has El wrought behold the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion he shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink of the blood of the slain and Balak said unto Balan neither curse them at all nor bless them at all but Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I you, saying that all that Yahweh speaks that I must do? And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray you, I will bring you into another place. Perchance it will please Elohim that you may curse me them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor that looks towards Yeshimon. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. I'm actually going to read all through 24, and then we're going to come back and kind of break down a few things in 23, and then I'm going to kind of share um, a theory I have with Balaam. 24. And when Balaam saw that it pleased Yahweh to bless Yashorel, he went not as other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. So, right? So he was, he you know, he finally came to Bala to Balak, and he's like, you know, probably there was something in his mind like, I would like the the money, you know. And so he's like seeking Yahweh, like, hey, can I curse them? And Yahweh's like, no. So finally he's like, okay, I can't curse them, so I'm just going to approach Yahweh. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Yashrael abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and the Ruach Elohim came upon him. So now the Ruach of Elohim is upon Balaam. You know, what's going on here? There's a lot of theories out there, and I've heard quite a few, and, I, you know, and some were like intriguing. I'm like, hmm, maybe that can make sense. But I have, a th I have a little different theory. Um, I think I shared a little bit last year. So if you watched last year, you probably already know. But And he took up this parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, the man whose eyes are open has said, he has said, 
which heard the words of El, which saw the visions of El Shaddai falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are your tents, O Yaakov, and your tabernacles, O Yasharel! As the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lin aloes, which Yahuwah has planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. That's just interesting here. As valleys are they spread forth, and as gardens by the riverside. And we know Psalm 1. Uh, blesses a man, right, who uh, walks on the council. Anyways, but it says the person that delights in the Torah, right, he should be like a tree planted by the, the river. Um, his uh, fruit uh, shall never wither, and his, no, his leaves shall not wither, right, and he'll continue to bring forth fruit. I'm broadly quoting it. Uh, anyways, uh, verse 8, El brought him forth out of Mitzrayim. He has, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations as enemies and shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. Surely this is prophecy about what's going to happen in uh, you know, Saul and David's time. And then, of course, even more so in the end times with uh, the, the fulfillment of the seed of Abraham and the fulfillment of the seed of David when his return as king of kings, our Messiah. He couched, he laid down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses you, and cursed is he that curses you. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And he smote his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies. And behold, you have altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee to your place. I thought to promote you into great honor, but lo, Yahuwah has kept you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, Spoke I not also to you to your messengers, which you sent unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of Yahuwah to do either good or bad of my own mind. But if Yahuwah says, That will I speak. And now, behold, I will go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advertise what this people shall do to your people in the latter days. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam, the son of Beor, has said, The man whose eyes are open has said, He has said, which heard the words of El and knew the knowledge of El Elyon, which saw the vision of El Shaddai falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Yashrael, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy the children of Sheth. Obviously, it's talking about Messiah, repeated in Genesis 49. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Yashrael shall do valiantly. Out of Yaakov shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remains of the city. Right? David. And when he looked out on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Canaanim and took up his parable and said, Strong is your dwelling place, and you put your neck in a rock. Nevertheless, Cainai shall be wasted until Ashur shall carry you away captive. And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when El does this? And ships shall come from the coast of Kittim, and shall afflict Ashur, and shall afflict Eber, and shall also perish forever. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. So we don't really get the error of Balaam here. Um, not plainly, at least. We'll, we'll, we'll see how the book of Numbers a little bit later uh, shows us this. But here in this, we're like, well, you know, what happened here? Um, and here's what happened. So Baal worship was next. Um, and Yashrael abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Like, where did this happen all of a sudden, right? And they called the people into the sacrifices of their Elohim. The people did eat and bow down to their Elohim. And Yashrael joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Yahuwah was kindled against Yashrael. And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before Yahuwah against the sun, that the fierce anger of Yahuwah may be turned away from Yashrael. And Moshe said unto the judges of Yashrael, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Yashrael came and brought unto his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moshe, and in the sight of all the assembly of the children of Yashrael, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the assembly. And when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the assembly and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Yashrael into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of the Yashrael and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Yashrael. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. So what happened between here, you know, the children of Israel can't be cursed. He finds no iniquity in them. And then pff, all of a sudden they're whoring, you know, they're eating the sacrifices of the dead, bowing down to Elohim and, uh, have, you know, committing fornication with these daughters of the Midianite women. So what happened, right? What happened? 
Uh, oh, earlier I was trying to share with you how Balak or Balaam knew the bullock and a ram. Just do a word search, bullock and a ram, and you'll see just you know countless times here about the offering. Maybe a bullock and a ram, a bullock and a ram, a bullock and a ram. Um, before we get to to Balaam, uh, one thing I wanted to point out here, I thought that was just really special. Uh, for from the top of the rocks I see him. Remember, this is Balaam prophesying. And from the hills I behold him. Lo, this people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Shall not be reckoned among the nations is very interesting. And that's what it means to be set apart, right? We're holy. We're set apart um, unto the Most High. And this stems from Deuteronomy 32, specifically in the Septuagint version. When the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the nations according to the number of the angel of Elohim. We talked about this in our Enoch study um, last week? This week. Last, I don't know. When did we talk about this? The 70, 70 angels. Oh, yeah. Last week, the um, the dream vision. We um, talked about the 70 angels, the, the Psalm 82, the council of the Elohim. Uh, and so, and then, of course, the 70 languages at, at the Tower of Babel. But there's a 71st nation, which is the Most High. He separated himself, right? And his people, Yaakov, became the portion of Yahweh. Israel was the line of his inheritance. So they were like the 71st nation that was not reckoned among the 70 nations. They were separated. They were separate. Um, and we'll see here. We'll read a couple things here. Hebrews 9, 12 through 14. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, of course, our Messiah, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So he, redemption is like a, a, like a purchase. He purchased us again. Even though we were sent away and scattered into the nations, he purchased us again by the blood of Messiah. For if the blood of bulls and goats and of the ashes of heifer, sprinkle of the unclean, sanctify us to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Elohim, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? 1 Corinthians 6.20 For you are bought, purchased with a price. right? Therefore glorify Elohim in your body and in your spirit, which are Elohim's. Isaiah 52, 1-10 Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city for henceforth. So from this time forward, there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. You loose yourself from the bands of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says Yahweh, you have sold yourselves for nothing, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Well, we know what we redeemed with the blood of Messiah. For thus says Yahweh, Elohim, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, says Yahweh, that my people has taken away from naught? That they rule, they that rule over them make them to howl, says Yahweh, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know that in the day that I am here, that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that brings good tidings, that publishes peace, that brings good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that says unto Zion, Your Elohim reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up your voice. With a voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when Yahweh shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for Yahweh has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem, or he purchased Jerusalem. Yahweh has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Elohim. So even though Messiah you know, already purchased us, there is still a time of redemption where he gets us. So he's paid the price. He's paid the bride price, right? And he's coming to get us. Well, I can only hope soon. I can only hope uh, soon, brothers and sisters. But this, this part right here, and shall not be reckoned among the nations, to Ezra 5, 21 through 27. And after seven days, the thoughts of my heart were very grievous to me again. Then my soul recovered the spirit of understanding, and I began once more to speak the words in the presence of the Most High. And I said, O sovereign master, from every forest of the earth and from all its trees, you have chosen one vine. And from all the lands of the world, you have chosen for yourself one region. And from all the flowers of the world, you have chosen for yourself one lily. And from all the depths of the sea, you have filled for yourself one river. And from all the cities, you have built you have consecrated Zion for yourself, and from all the birds you have, that have been created, you name for yourself one dove. And from all the flocks that have been made, you have provided yourself one sheep. And from all the multitude of the peoples, you have gotten for yourself one people. And to this people, whom you all have loved, have given the Torah, which is approved by all. And we know this is the, this is the, uh, the, the seed of Abraham, the children of Abraham. And we know that we are the children of Abraham, not by birth, not by blood, right? 
but by Messiah Yahusha, by belief in him. So praise Yah. Praise Yah. It's, it's good to be a special people. I don't know if we think about this enough. Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak unto the children of Israel. Praise Yah. Okay, so now, 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 I want to talk to you about Balaam. So my, my theory here is, let's read Revelation 2. But I have a few things against you because you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So you too, so in the same way, you have some in the, who hold the way to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So what, so what happened here? So I'm going to scroll, scroll down here. Numbers 31, 16. Behold, they caused the son of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to be unfaithful to Yahweh in the matter of Peor so that the plague took place among the congregation of Yahweh. So we can only by that way deduce that Balaam taught Balak and said, you know what? Hey, I can't curse them. But guess what? Because he was a wise man. He said he had wisdom. He said, I can't curse them, but guess what? Check this out. Check this out, Balak. They can curse themselves. Here's what we need to do. And it's interesting in the Targum that says, And now, behold, I return to my people. Come, I will give you counsel. He's talking to Balak. Go furnish tavern houses and employ seductive women to sell food and drinks cheaply and to bring this people together to eat and drink and to commit whoredom with them that they may deny their Elohim then in a brief time they'll be delivered into your hand and many of them fall. Nevertheless, after this, they will have still have dominion over your people in the end of days. And then a little bit later, and Balaam rose up and went to return to his place. And Balak also went up his way and appointed the daughters of Midianites for the tavern booths at Beth Jeshemosh by the snow mountain where they sold sweet meats cheaper than their price after the council of Balaam, the wicked, at the dividing of the way. So Balaam was like, hey, we can't curse them but they can curse themselves because my I mean, here's my theory and i think it'll flush out here uh flesh out here in second peter 2 um i believe that balaam was a, a wicked dude totally wicked dude um a magician enchanter a diviner um just a wicked guy that had wickedness in his heart i believe he saw he first of all he knew everything that israel did and then he was in egypt when he saw everything i have a feeling that he was like whoa this is not this is this is not magic this is like the finger of yahuwah because remember pharaoh's counselors came up to to pharaoh and said you know we can't we can't you know this is this is from the finger of elohim i think it was the boils maybe finally the boils and the 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 magicians went to pharaoh and were like you know this is this is not you know this is not uh, you know magic this is the finger of elohim very so it's very possible that we know that the magicians that withstood um, Moshe and Aharon with the the, sta the staves were Jonathan Jambres, you know, Balaam's sons. Very possible that Balaam saw that and was like, all right, I'm out. You know, maybe I want to serve this Elohim. Maybe he repented. And maybe he went to serve Elohim. How else does Elohim speaking to him? How else does Balaam know to say, I can't do anything other than, than what Yahweh speaks? The only that can I do. And then he sees him and he's like, I repent. It seems like he was a changed man, but it looked like he turned from the way and wanted the money. And so he concocted the evil plan and Israel bit and they took the bait in the same way. And I'll, and I'll try to, and I'll try to share that with you in second Peter two, in the same way, the whole world acts or follows the ways of Balaam, you know, to, to get them to stumble. I mean, <laughs> It's been a while since I watched TV, but like, look at all the commercials. It's like over indulgence of food and forbidden food, abomination, abominable food, um, alcohol. Um, well, back in the day, it used to be cigarettes, of course, uh, get the people to kill themselves quickly. Um, you know, uh, pharmacia, sorcery type drugs, you know, um, and, and just look at, you know, TV shows and movies and, and they teach people this this wicked behavior and of course you know modern day making um alternative lifestyles like looking joyful like they're like they're typically the funniest characters on tv shows and 
very likable and people are like well they're not bad you know these alternative lifestyles and people are like you know maybe i'll try that and people fall into you know diverse temptations um and so get, they're getting people to curse themselves even people that are bought and redeemed by the blood of messiah through you know <laughs> pagan practices all kinds of evils and so people are just slaying themselves by following the directives of Balaam like hey here here's cheap alcohol and cheap you know uh, cheap women have at it have fun anybody that watched Pinocchio back in the day like Pleasure Island right anyways so here let's say let's read second Peter 2 but false false prophets also appeared among the people just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them and we've seen this bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their indecent behavior, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. I don't know what to say, brothers and sisters, but I have seen this firsthand. This right here as well. For if Elohim did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, held for judgment, and did not, did not spare the ancient world, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example of what is coming for the ungodly, and if he, and if he rescued righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the perverted conduct of unscrupulous people, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then Yahweh knows how to rescue the ungodly from a trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the flesh in its corrupt, corrupt passion and despise authority. Reckless, self-centered, they speak abusively of angelic, angelic majesties without trembling, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a demeaning judgment against them before Yahuwah. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, using abusive speech where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of wrongdoing. They counted a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Now listening, listen to this. Abandoning the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the reward of righteousness. Now, here's my theory. He was a wicked man. He repented. Yah spoke to him. Yah used him. And then he abandoned the right way and went back. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to I wanna follow that up with the end here. But he received a rebuke for his own offense, for a mute donkey speaking with human voice restrained the insanity of the prophet. These are springs without water and mist driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For while speaking out arrogant words of no value, they entice by fleshly desires, by indecent behavior. Those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. Now listen, for by what anyone is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge and savior of Messiah Yahushua, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. And this, I believe, is culminating talking about what happened to Balaam. He, right... He escaped the defilements, right? But he got entangled in them again, and the last day became worse from the first. For it would have been better to have not known the way of righteousness than to have known it to turn away, right? And that's what it says here. Abandoning the right way, they have gone astray after following after Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the reward of righteousness. So he loved riches and the honor of this world. So he turned back and became like a dog that went back to his vomit and a pig that was washed right back to jumping in the mud so what's that lesson for us you know do we have to be diviners and enchanters to be you know someone like Balaam I mean he did all kinds of disgusting terrible things 
and it seemed as though he went back to the right way. Otherwise, why is Elohim speaking to him and using him as a prophet? There's many different um, theories out there, and I've seen some some good arguments. Um, but it, it's Peter seems to kind of wrap this one up for us that Balaam turned from the right way and went back, and he is like a dog returned to his vomit. So look at us. What has the Most High delivered us from? Right? Were you a drunkard before you came to him? Right? And he healed you of that, and time has passed, and oh, are you going to return back to that and become a drunkard again? I'm not saying alcohol is not a sin, right? People that can control themselves and have a drink or two, that's, that's not drunkenness, right? He, it said he made, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just using alcohol as an example. It would be like a drunkard that came and repented and was healed and walked in the way and then became a drunkard again, and it's like a decline back to his ways, right? So we've got to be very, very careful, right? Every, there's there's so many different um, vices or, or um, ways that people, you know, can be tangled in this world. I'm just using, you know, alcohol as one. It could be money like we saw with Bilam. People could have, could have a love for money, repent and not care, and then kind of the love of money kind of, you know, creep back in. Satan, you know, he's got his, you know, his people. He knows what people's weaknesses are, and he's going to try to entice to get you back. There's a lot of different things. So all you have to do, search your heart, search your life, right? And see what those things are. You could be tested on those. Maybe you already have. Maybe you've already seen this. Maybe you've been like, wow, I totally got tested on, you know, um, my, the summoning blocks in my in previously in my life. So let us learn the lesson of Balaam and let us go nowhere near it. Nowhere near these, these stumbling blocks of ours. It's also interesting here, uh, Numbers twenty three twenty one. It says he has not beheld iniquity in Yaakov, right? How you know how does that happen with like people murmuring and you know Korah's rebellion and Nathan and Abiram and all you know? Well, number one, the, the the transgressors were killed off, so that's one possibility, right? But for those that repent and keep his ways, there is forgiveness. So think about us in our time. We've been we, we've repented, and we've been forgiven. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Boy, so many people have tried to make this verse say, you know, mean it's something other than it says plainly, but I, it says what it says. If you've come to him and you just go on sinning willfully, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, which the truth is defined as our Messiah and the Torah, and if you turn and you sin willfully, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but of a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moshe's Torah die without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of Elohim and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongs unto me. I will recompense, says Yahuwah. And again, Yahuwah shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. That's kind of what I was telling you. Like, we come into this way, right? And we're tested. We're tested hard. Just like the people came out of Egypt. They were tested and tested hard. And most people fell. That's why Messiah says, Many are called, but few are chosen. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of Elohim, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Just like Balaam, right? He drew back. But if but we are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe the saving of the soul. Praise Yahuwah. Oh, let's see. 24, 24. 23, 24, what I have here. Oh, here's a prophecy. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift him himself up as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. 
And the remnant of Yaakov shall be in, I'm sorry, this is Micah 5, 7 through 15. And the remnant of Yaakov shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from Yahuwah, as the showers upon the grass that tarries not for man, nor waits for the sons of men. And the remnant of Yaakov shall be among the nations in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, who, if you go through, both treads down and tears in pieces and none can deliver. <sighs> Thine hand shall be lifted upon your adversaries and your enemies shall be cut off. And it shall come to pass in that day, says Yahweh, that I'll cut off your horses out of the midst of you, and I'll destroy your chariots, and I'll cut off the cities of your land, and throw down all your strongholds. And I'll cut off witchcrafts out of your hand, and you shall have no more soothsayers. Your graven images also will I cut off, and your standing images out of the midst of you, and you shall no more worship the work of your hands. And I'll pluck up your groves out of the midst of you, so will I destroy thy cities. And I'll execute uh, vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. And this is the time to come. This is a time to come where the people of Yahuwah are scattered among the nations, but will become, instead of the um, the prey, they'll be the predator. So, very interesting. Very interesting indeed. So I think we'll uh, wrap it up there, brothers and sisters. We'll talk, There's at the end of, at the end of 25, I was talking about Phinehas, but you know, uh, next uh, Torah portion is Phinehas, so we'll, we'll leave that uh, for next week. So, um, with that, a couple of announcements. A lot of you have been asking about the signups. I'm so sorry that this is just keep continuing to delay, delay, delay. Uh, we've had some issues uh, with getting it up and going. Uh, some of you have been concerned because it says Sukkot is full. Uh, that's from last year. Sorry, I don't know why that webpage is still up, but um, the registration was full last year. The registration is not full this year. It hasn't even opened yet. Um, and I know some of you are, are waiting. I've seen your emails and stuff. Uh, so it's supposed to be done today by tonight um so um just check the check the um description box of this video and um it should give you the link that you can sign up and register so uh, blessings to you shabbat shalom enjoy the rest of your shabbat or whenever your uh rest of your day whenever you're listening to this and uh yahweh will bless you and keep you yahweh will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you yahweh will lift up his countenance upon you and give you Shalom. Shabbat shalom, brothers and sisters.
if you're still here, I forgot to pray. Father Yahuwah Most High, we just come before you again and bless you and thank you for allowing us to study your word together all across the four corners of this earth. Father, I just pray that you'd give all of us understanding and wisdom and knowledge in your word, that we may be found faithful hearers and doers when Messiah Husha returns, that we may not be ashamed of his return, Father. We pray to be called and chosen, Father. Show us the way. Show us the right way, Father. We love you and bless you and strengthen us, Father, that none of us fall by the wayside, that none of us return back to our own vomit. We love you in Yahushua's mighty name. Amen. Okay, now Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>